Good afternoon, everyone. Before I begin, I want to say a few words, a few brief words about the explosion that took place uh, Friday in Nashville, Tennessee. Federal, state, and local law enforcement uh, working around the clock to gain more information on motive and intent. This bombing was a reminder of the destructive power that an individual or a small group can muster and the need for continuing vigilance across the board. I want to thank the police department in Nashville, particularly those five police officers who worked so quickly to evacuate the area before the explosion occurred, risking their own lives. And for all the firefighters and first responders who jumped into action early on that Christmas morning, last Christmas morning, their bravery and cool-headedness likely saved lives and prevented a worse outcome, and we are eternally grateful to that law enforcement agency. And uh, I know the hearts of all Americans are the people of Nashville as they rebuild and recover from this traumatic event. Now, Vice President Harris and I, along with our nominees to lead the national security institutions, have just been briefed by some of the professionals who have been conducting agency reviews as a part of our transition. This is a long-standing part of the orderly transition of power in American democracy. We welcomed teams from the incoming Trump-Pence administration four years ago, gave them access to all that we had. And over the past few weeks, teams of genuine policy and management experts, many of them previous government experience who have gone into agencies across the government to conduct interviews with personnel, to uh, gather information, and to assess the state of the federal government <coughs> excuse me, that we will shortly inherit. These teams worked under incredibly difficult circumstances, taking COVID-19 precautions and waiting weeks for the ascertainment, meaning that so they could go in and be clear, clear to go in. But uh, they have done an outstanding job. For some agencies, our teams received exemplary cooperation from the career staff in those agencies. From others, most notably the Department of Defense, uh, we encountered obstruction from the political leadership of that department. And the truth is, many of the agencies that are critical to our security have incurred enormous damage. Many of them have been hollowed out in personnel, capacity, and in morale in the policy processes that have atrophied or have been sidelined, in the despair of our alliances and the disrepair of those alliances, in our absence from key institutions that matter to the welfare of the American people, in the general disengagement from the world, and all of what makes it harder for our government to protect the American people, to, uh, to defend our vital interests, in a world where threats are constantly evolving and our adversaries are constantly adapting. Rebuilding the full set of our instruments of foreign policy and national security is a key challenge that the Vice President-elect Harris and I will face upon taking office, starting with our diplomacy. Today, we heard from the leaders of the state and USAID agency review teams about the critical early investment we're going to need to make in our diplomacy, in our development efforts, and in rebuilding our alliances to close the ranks with our partners and bring to bear the full benefits of our shared strength for the American people. When we consider the most daunting threats of our time, we know that meeting them requires American engagement and American leadership, but also that none of them can be solved by America acting alone. Take climate change, for example. The United States accounts for less than 15 percent of the global carbon emissions. But without clear, coordinated, and committed approach from the other 85 percent of the carbon emitters, the world will continue to warm. Storms will continue to worsen. Climate change will continue to threaten the lives and livelihoods and public health and economics of our existence and our, literally, the very existence of our planet. We've learned so painfully this year the cost of being unprepared for a pandemic that leaps borders and circles the globe.
we're going to — if we aren't investing with our partners around the world to strengthen the health systems everywhere, we're undermining our ability to permanently defeat COVID-19, and we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to the next deadly epidemic. And as we uh, compete with China to hold China's government accountable for its trade abuses, technology, human rights, and other fronts, our position will be much stronger when we build coalitions of like-minded partners and allies that make common cause with us in defense of our shared interests and our shared values. We make up only 25 percent, almost 25 percent, of the entire economy of the world. But together with our democratic partners, we more than double our economic leverage. On any issue that matters to the U.S. and China relationship, from pursuing a foreign policy for the middle class, including a trade and economic agenda that produces and protects American workers, our intellectual prosperity and the environment, to ensuring security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region, to championing human rights, we're stronger and more effective when we're flanked by nations that share our vision and the future of our world. That's how we multiply the impact of our efforts and make those efforts more sustainable. That's the power of smart, effective American leadership. But right now, there's an enormous vacuum. We're going to have to regain the trust and confidence of a world that has begun to find ways to work around us or work without us. We also heard from key leaders of our intelligence and defense review teams, including Stephanie O'Sullivan, former principal deputy director of the National Intelligence and retired Army Lieutenant General Karen Gibson. We talked about the different strategic challenges we're going to face from both Russia and China and the reforms we must make to put ourselves in the strongest possible position to meet those challenges. That includes modernizing our defense priorities to better deter aggression in the future, rather than, continu rather than continuing to overinvest in legacy systems designed to address threats of the past. We have to be able to innovate, to reimagine our defenses against growing threats in new realms like cyberspace. We're still learning about the extent of the solar winds hack and the vulnerabilities that have been exposed. As I said last week, this attack constitutes a grave risk to our national security. We need to close the gap between where our capabilities are now and where they need to be to better deter, detect, disrupt, and respond to those sorts of intrusions in the future. This is an area where Republicans and Democrats are in agreement, and we should be able to work on a bipartisan basis to better secure the American people against malign cyber actors. And right now, as our nation is in a period of transition, we need to make sure that nothing is lost in the handoff between administrations. My team needs a clear picture of our force posture around the world and our operations to deter our enemies. We need full visibility into the budget planning underway at the Defense Department and other agencies in order to avoid any window of confusion or catch-up that our adversaries may try to exploit. But as I said from the beginning, we have encountered roadblocks from the political leadership at the Department of Defense and the Office of Management and Budget. Right now, we just aren't getting all the information that we need for the ongoing — outgoing — from the outgoing administration in key national security areas. It's nothing short, in my view, of irresponsibility. Finally, we spoke about the day one challenge that we're going to need to address immediately, drawing on the skill sets of the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We were briefed on the steps needed to clean up the humanitarian disaster that the Trump administration has systematically created on our southern border. We will institute humane and orderly responses. That means rebuilding the capacity we need to safely and quickly process asylum seekers without creating near-term crisis in the midst of this deadly pandemic. These are hard issues, and the current administration has made them much harder by working to erode our capacity. 
It's going to take time to rebuild that capacity. We're going to work purposely, diligently, and responsibly to roll back Trump's restrictions starting on day one. But it is not as simple as throwing a switch to turn everything back on, especially amid a pandemic. We'll have to have a process to ensure everyone's health and safety, including the safety of asylum seekers, hoping for a new start in the United States, free of violence and persecution. Of course, an essential part of this will be managing the safe, equitable, and efficient distribution of vaccinations to as many Americans as possible, as quickly as possible. FEMA has an enormous, enorm enormous part to play in this. And we heard from the former FEMA director, Craig Fugate, today. We want to make sure that our administration is poised to make full use of FEMA's domestic reach and capacity in managing our COVID response. And finally, from every briefer, I was heartened. I was literally heartened to hear about the incredible strength we'll be inheriting in the career professionals and working people across these agencies. They never stop doing their jobs and continue to serve our country day in and day out to keep their fellow Americans safe, just as they've always done. These agencies are filled with patriots who have earned our respect and who should never be treated as political footballs. I'm looking forward to the honor of working with them again, to asking for their advice and inputs to help shape the best possible policies for all Americans. I want to thank the incredible folks who've served on these agency review teams as part of this transition. They're, they've dedicated their time and energy, their vital experience and expertise to help ensure Vice President Harris and I are ready to hit the ground running. And we look forward to the start of a new year, fresh with hope and possibilities for better days to come. But clear-eyed, clear-eyed about the challenges that will not disappear overnight. I'm going to reiterate my message to the American people. We've overcome incredible challenges as a nation, and we've done it before, and we will do it again. We'll do it by coming together, by uniting after years of pain and loss, a year particularly needed to heal, to rebuild, to reclaim America's place in the world. This is the work that lies ahead of us, and I know we're up to the task. We will champion liberty and democracy once more. We will reclaim our credibility to lead the free world. And we will, once again, lead not just by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.